Welcome to this session of Maritime Medicine, in which we discuss central nervous system trauma and management, including traumatic brain injury and spinal injury. By the end of this session, you'll be able to identify the major anatomical structures of the central nervous system, identify at least four significant intracranial injuries, and two red flag signs or symptoms of a spinal cord injury. You'll also be able to identify the minimum target blood pressure that you want to attempt to maintain in a patient with significant traumatic brain injury. So what's the big deal about head and spinal injury? Well, 25% of trauma patients who die, die of head injuries. <clears throat> and in 50% of motor vehicle crashes, it's the cause of death. For those who survive with a significant brain injury, there's long-term disability, often permanent disability. And because this is an injury that tends to happen in younger populations, you take previously healthy, productive members of society and essentially make them dependent, completely dependent, on others to support them. They're often associated with cervical spine injuries, so because of that, head injuries lead to not only the cognitive or thought, thinking, behavior problems, but also to paralysis and the other issues that go along with a spinal injury. And spinal cord injuries, even on their own without a head injury, are often associated with death, and if not death, long-term disability because of the permanent nature of the injury. If you can recognize and treat these injuries early, you can improve the outcome. And so it's important to be aware of the injuries or at least of the potential of these injuries for any given patient. So let's start with a brief anatomy review. Start with the skull, and on the left you can see a whole skull, all the bones fused together. In the center, what you see is a skull with the various bones that make up the skull clearly marked, and particularly the bones, the frontal, parietal, temporal, and occipital that make up your skull case, those lines where they fuse together are open. Those are growth areas when your brain is developing, when you're growing, and then when you stop growing, they fuse together. And then you've got your mid-face bones, your nasal bone, your zygomatic arch, and your maxilla that you can see on the front of the face. And then the mandible as a single bone that articulates with the rest of the skull to move your jaw. It's essentially your jaw, and then your teeth in the maxilla and the mandible. On the right, what you're looking at is the base of the skull. So the top of the skull has been cut off, and you're looking straight down into the base. And you can see how rough and irregular that is. And that's important because with a head injury, as the brain moves, the base of the skull is rubbing back and forth on there. And you look and you see superior most the skull and the air sinuses in it. And then as you move slightly posterior in the midline, you see that area that almost looks like punched out Swiss cheese. And that's the cribriform plate. That's a, a spot in the base of the skull, more or less above where your eyes and nasal bone are. And that's an area that's easily fractured. You move a little bit more, more posteriorly. And you can see on both the right and the left small holes where the carotid arteries enter the skull. And then more posteriorly, you see a large hole, and that's the foramen magnum. That's the big hole where the spinal cord comes out through the base of the skull. That's also where, when you have an injury, like bleeding, that's increasing pressure in the skull and pushing the brain downwards, that's where the brain tries to escape from the skull through the bottom, and that's called brain herniation. So within the skull, you have the brain. And on the left, you see a picture from the top of the brain. And you can see uh, the fissures, the sulci, and the gyri, the raised areas of the brain. And that's to increase the surface area. And that impacts the number of nerves that you can pack into the brain. And the brain's divided into different areas each of which is generally responsible for different functions. And particularly the frontal area is responsible for consciousness and behavior, thought processes, higher processing. In the middle, you can see a cross section. And you can see that the brain isn't a single solid structure. There's actually a number of different structures inside. 
and you can see how the gray and white matter there, the outside, surrounds those interior structures. You also have what are called ventricles inside, which are spaces where cerebrospinal fluid, essentially a lubricating and protected fluid for the brain, flows through and then down the spinal cord. And you can see on the posterior of the patient in the middle where the spinal cord is exiting through the skull. Right behind that is a small area that's in cross-section looks white called the cerebellum. And that is responsible for coordination and movement. And so that's an important part of the brain where strokes are possible as well. And then looking to the right of the slide, you can see the patient's brain in its entirety looking at it laterally. You can see the cerebellum. You can see the spinal cord entering down into the spinal canal and the relationship of the brain to the facial bones. And in particular, look at the inferior most portion of the brain. And you can see that it actually, in the front, rises a little bit higher, your frontal lobes, over the eyes, over the orbits, and then drops down. And if you remember what the base of the skull looked like, you could see how parts of the brain could be more injured during a traumatic injury as the brain shifts back and forth inside the skull, even if it's ever so slightly. So, again, trauma would be transfer of energy from any source to the soft tissue causing damage. And so what forces can impact the brain? Well, you can have forces that are transferred directly through the skull. The skull is a hard structure, and so force is transmitted through it uh, fairly easily, propagates that force, and it directly impacts the brain. The brain will move inside the skull, cause injuries as it strikes the interior of the skull or as it slides across the base of the skull. And then with penetrating trauma, you can have direct trauma to the brain. So, of course, you can end up with blunt or penetrating injury patterns. And with blunt, you can actually end up with the direct injury, the coup injury, where the skull strikes a fixed object, the brain moves forward, and the force is directly transmitted against the front of the brain, but then the brain will move backwards and strike the back of the skull and you end up with what's called the contra-coup injury. So coup contra-coup uh, is a very common injury pattern in significant blunt trauma. From your perspective, probably the more important concept is that of the primary versus the secondary brain injury. In the primary brain injury, that's the injury that occurs at the time of the force application. So there's the initial application of force, the injury occurs. The only way that you could mitigate that is to prevent the injury from happening or use protective equipment to decrease the force that's transferred to the brain. Otherwise, that's already happened by the time you're called to care for a patient. There's not much you're going to do about that. Secondary injury is actually very important. And this is what we can do to try to decrease injury. So in secondary injury, you get decreased oxygen to the brain or decreased blood flow to the brain, which re relates to decreased oxygen. You're flowing less blood, less oxygen makes it to the brain, and this induces a secondary injury. Now, this can happen from swelling and bleeding around the brain, and again, you can't do much about that. That's the result directly of the primary injury. But if the patient is globally hypoxic, they have an airway problem, they're not breathing well, spinal cord injury paralyzes the diaphragm, whatever reason, they're not getting enough oxygen, that can cause a secondary brain injury, and you can provide additional oxygen. You can breathe for patients by ventilating them, and you can prevent or decrease the impact of that hypoxic brain injury. And hypotension, decreased blood flow to the brain because globally the blood pressure is low, can also cause this injury. And so by protecting the airway and giving oxygen to prevent hypoxia, by maintaining a systolic blood pressure of greater than 90 millimeters mercury, preferably in an isolated hand injury somewhere between 110 and 120 millimeters mercury, you can decrease the risk of a secondary brain injury and prevent some of them with this good management. If you think of your skull as a solid box, it's fixed, it doesn't really have a way of expanding to accommodate increased pressure, the only real escape for increased pressure is through the foramen magnum. Uh, 
and you're pushing blood flow in and you're creating cerebral spinal fluid and you've got metabolic processes going on, there's going to be a certain pressure inside of the skull. And that's called the intracranial pressure. And normally it's less than 15 millimeters mercury. And that's the global pressure inside the skull. So anything else wanting to get into the skull, like blood flow, for example, has to overcome intracranial pressure. Well, your brain has what's called the cerebral perfusion pressure, and that's the pressure of blood actually making it into the brain. And that depends on your blood pressure and the intracranial pressure. So for the blood pressure, we're talking about something called the mean arterial pressure, or MAP. It's your diastolic pressure plus one-third, the difference between your systolic and your diastolic pressure, what's called your pulse pressure. Don't worry about the formula. You don't have to know that. You're not going to be calculating the MAP to figure out what someone's cerebral perfusion pressure is. But understand that your blood pressure is the driver for blood flow going into the brain. So your cerebral perfusion pressure is that MAP, the mean arterial pressure, or essentially an average measurement of blood pressure that the brain sees over time, minus the intracranial pressure. So whatever the blood pressure is, take out the intracranial pressure. That's the, the force that the amount of pressure that had to be overcome just to get blood flow to the brain. And what's left is the pressure of blood getting to your brain, your cerebral perfusion pressure. And since the skull is a closed box, if you increase the intracranial pressure, you'll decrease the cerebral perfusion pressure. There's no other way to do this. So ICP goes up. If your MAP doesn't change, your CPP is going to go down. Your body doesn't like that. Your body likes to have good blood flow to the brain. And so your body will attempt to increase your blood pressure to maintain the cerebral perfusion pressure. And in someone with a head injury, that works for a while. But eventually, the pressure inside the skull, the intracranial pressure, increases so much that that mechanism fails. Now, carbon dioxide also plays a role in cerebral perfusion. Your blood level of carbon dioxide affects the width of your cerebral blood vessels. The lower the carbon dioxide, the more narrow the cerebral blood vessels. And if you narrow your cerebral blood vessels, you decrease your cerebral perfusion. So that doesn't seem like a great thing to do. But on the other hand, if you narrow your blood vessels, you also decrease your intracranial pressure. And that might be useful if you had a really high intracranial pressure. So there might be some use to trying to do this. How do you do it? Well, if you hyperventilate your patient, you breathe for them more than 20 breaths a minute, you will decrease their carbon dioxide levels below normal, and you will decrease their intracranial pressure. Now, unfortunately, in the long run, hours, you're decreasing the blood flow to the brain enough that essentially you're causing local hypoperfusion, local shock, and you worsen the patient's outcome. But in the short term, there might be some use to doing this, and that would be in a patient who is showing signs of herniation syndrome, and that's where the brain is trying to escape through the foramen magnum because the intracranial pressure is so high. We'll talk later about what the signs of herniation syndrome are, but if you see them, and if you think that you can get the patient evacuated to a neurosurgical facility, somewhere where someone can basically drill a hole through the skull to give another route of pressure escape, then it might be worth trying to hyperventilate the patient and in the short term, narrow those blood vessels, decrease the intracranial pressure, and keep them alive in hopes that by fixing the problem of the increased intracranial pressure, you can stop hyperventilating them soon enough that you don't do a lot of brain damage with that decreased cerebral perfusion pressure. So herniation syndrome is when your brain is trying to escape through that big hole right there in the base of your skull, the foramen magnum. So there's pressure in the skull. Your intracranial pressure is high. There's bleeding. There's swelling. And this is compressing the brain. And the only way for the pressure to be relieved is for the brain to start to herniate or go out through that hole. So all the nerves on the base of the brain, uh, the spinal cord and the base of the brain itself get compressed as they pass through there. So the patient will be in a coma because this is a significant brain injury. Because the nerves that control your pupils run right along the base of the brain right there, you'll get dilation of the pupils, either both pupils or the pupil on the opposite side from where the brain, is, the brain injury is. The patient's breathing will slow down. 
and now they've got this high intracranial pressure, and so Cushing's reflex kicks in, and that's this very high blood pressure. And at the same time, the carotid arteries have sensors in them outside of the skull that say, whoa, blood pressure way too high, doing damage in the rest of the body, and they slow the heart rate down to try to decrease the the blood pressure that way by decreasing the rate and try to limit damage in the other organs. And so these are all very bad signs. If you can't get this patient to a neurosurgeon immediately, they're going to die no matter what. So within minutes to up to an hour possibly, but even an hour is really stretching it. So if you're just about to load the patient on the helicopter with their head injury and they start to do this, then doing hyperventilation, trying to push down that carbon dioxide and decrease the intracranial pressure might be worth trying. But if, and really you're not going to hurt the patient by doing it because they're, they're dying at this point. But if you can't evacuate them, you'll start hyperventilation. Briefly, you'll decrease the intracranial pressure. Then that original injury, the swelling, the bleeding will continue to progress and the patient will herniate and die. So the scalp is very vascular. There's a lot of blood vessels and scalp wound. They can bleed quite a bit. In fact, they can bleed so much that people can bleed to death from just a scalp laceration. I've seen that happen. And unfortunately, what tends to happen is the patient gets a scalp laceration, a significant one like this. And the first person taking care of them takes some dressing, some 4 by 4s or some other pad and puts it over the wound. And they just push it on the wound. And so they don't actually stop the bleeding. So those soak through. And then they put another layer on, another layer on, and another layer on. And the blood keeps soaking through. And there's just such brisk bleeding that all this bandage material being put onto the wound isn't controlling the one spot, the one artery. Usually there's a, a dominant artery that's bleeding. And eventually there's just this huge turban of bandage material that soaks through with the patient's entire blood volume and the patient dies. So you need to look at the patient's scalp wound and figure out where the squirting blood is coming from, where the arterial blood is, and put your finger directly on that. Create your direct pressure directly on that bleeding site. And you may be able to do it by pushing the flap back down. You may have to just lift the flap up, find the squirting blood, put your finger on it, and press down on it and hold it there. Sometimes you need to put a procoagulant like quick clot or some of these other agents onto there to help a clot form. And sometimes these patients need to have their wounds stapled or sewn shut. And I've had patients with severe scalp lacerations who are intoxicated or they have a head injury causing altered mental status and they're fighting and we just take a stapler and use a skin stapler and staple the, the wound closed and we put a 4x4 four four into it so that's hanging out so that everybody knows this wasn't a permanent closure. We haven't cleaned the wound. We're just trying to get it closed to stop the bleeding because once the skin's closed, the blood collects under the scalp and while it can dissect the scalp off the skull, eventually there's enough pressure on that to stop the bleeding. And then you need to look at an injury like this and be really concerned about underlying injuries on these patients. What else did they injure when they got this initial injury? But make sure you stop that bleeding because it can be exsanguinating hemorrhage for these patients. So what lies directly under the scalp? Well, the skull does. And with enough force, you can break the skull. And you essentially get three types of fractures. You get linear non-displaced. So as you're looking at the skull on the right, on the skull's left, there's that long linear fracture that's going up over the top and towards the back. It's not displaced, and it's a linear skull fracture that you may never even know is there on your exam. If the overlying tissue is intact, you push on that, it'll be tender there, but you may not feel anything else. You may also have a depressed skull fracture. So if you look directly in the center of that skull's forehead, you see how the bone is pushed in. That you will feel. You'll push on that and you'll feel the bone sinking under your fingers. Or you can have a compound or open skull fracture. And that can either be because you have a fracture like that depressed skull fracture and there's an open wound over it. Or like the patient on the left, you have a penetrating injury 
that goes through the skull and into the brain. Now you can also get fractures of the base of the skull, so not really the dome that's covered with scalp, but where it connects into the face. And they're very easy to miss, but they're very bad to miss because if they're large enough, they can lead to infection and bleeding. It's essentially an open wound into the brain. So findings that would make you concerned for someone with head trauma would be what are called raccoon's eyes, so black circles around the eyes. It's bleeding into the, the soft tissue around the eyes. What are called battle signs, which is bruising behind the ears. It's bleeding into that space. And then the most concerning one is what's called CSF, or cerebrospinal fluid rhinorrhea, which is the CSF, the fluid that bathes and protects and helps to nurture and support the brain, is leaking out of the nose. It can come out of the ears as well, but the nose uh, is the more con concerning and commonplace because you remember that cribiform plate that we saw when we looked at the base of the skull that can fracture, and if you injure the meninges that covers around the brain, that CSF can start leaking out, and it looks like the patient has a runny nose, often mixed with blood, so it's like bloody snot coming out of their nose. Now, there are people who have minor head injuries with cribriform plate fractures who have this for a while until it heals up, but that's not who we're talking about. We're talking about the patient with a major head injury. This stuff will pour like water out of their nose. It is important to note that if you do have a patient who suffered a minor head injury and then suddenly has what looks like a continuous runny nose, that you should be concerned about the basilar skull fracture and talk to medical direction about that because that's someone who you're likely going to end up evacuating even if you wouldn't otherwise think that you needed to. All right, having worked our way through the scalp and the skull, now let's talk about the brain. And we have what I would call non-focal brain injuries or focal brain injuries. And non-focal brain injuries are either global brain injuries or we don't see one specific area of injury. And the most common of those is the concussion. So that's essentially an injury to the brain, shaking up or bruising of the brain without any ability to see it on CAT scan or other radiographic studies. So we don't see bleeding um, of any significance when we do our studies. These patients may have a loss of consciousness, and then they tend to have low-grade symptoms over the following days up to a week or two. Anything longer than that is concerning, but for a week or two, they can have some difficulty focusing and concentrating. They may feel confused. They'll often have headaches. They may have memory loss around the event, and then they may have patchy memory loss after that. They may have trouble with coordination. They in, have incoordination. They tend to stumble. They drop things. And they may have personality changes, although, frankly, if you hit your head and have a headache, you're probably going to be kind of grumpy anyway. But these are low-grade symptoms. They tend to resolve on their own over a week or so. If they don't, then we worry that the patient has what's called post-concussive syndrome, which can persist for months in a select view. And for some, it's an almost permanent disability. And this can be incredibly disabling. Think about your own jobs. You are required to make snap decisions, to show good judgment, to be able to process information and to use your hands to be dexterous and able to do manual work. If you can't do that, you can't do your job. And this can be from a relatively minor head injury that you end up with these uh, significant disabilities. Now, another relatively non-focal brain injury is what's called the cerebral contusion or bruise. It's very superficial bruising of the brain, maybe tiny areas of bleeding inside the brain tissue, but there's not really a big dominant area. And these tend not to be global injuries, although because it takes a fair amount of trauma to do this, your patient will have some altered mental status, a Glasgow Coma Score of 14, slight confusion. They'll have a headache because there was the injury. And generally, there's not really focal findings like you would find with a stroke or with certain types of focal bleeding inside the brain. But if you bruise the frontal lobes, there may be a little bit of personality change. So there can be some mild focality. But don't look for complete left-sided weakness or some other finding like that. that. That should make you think something else is going on. Now, if you have a really major trauma, but not enough that it causes a focal area of bleeding, you can get this really bad injury called a diffuse axonal injury. And the, the nerves, the cells are called axons, the, the parts of them that extend out from the cell bodies. And 
you can basically shear those off of the cell bodies or at least injure them where they're connecting to other parts of the brain. So there's not one area of injury. It's injured all over. And there's lots of swelling and edema. The patient's unresponsive. And when we see diffuse axonal injury on a CAT scan, it's in a comatose patient, and they're unlikely to survive. And if they do, they will have significant permanent disability. Now, the other really bad non-focal global brain injury we worry about is the anoxic or hypoxic brain injury. So the brain without oxygen or with low oxygen levels and this is a diffuse injury, and this is one of those secondary injuries we've talked about, and it's caused by inadequate perfusion. So you've got inadequate blood flow to the brain from low blood pressure, hypotension from other injuries, or inadequate oxygenation. So you have a patient has an airway obstruction, or you don't provide enough oxygen to them, or you don't ventilate them, and they have low blood oxygen levels, and this damages the brain. These patients tend to be comatose, and if they survive, they have long-term disability, often in a persistent vegetative state, because when you damage the brain so globally, it's hard to return to any level of function. And there are people who can get mild anoxic and hypoxic brain injuries, but the problem is in trauma, they tend to have these injuries related to a number of other injuries as well. And so they just tend to have this in a longer state of anoxia or hypoxia, and they just tend to do very poorly. Directly under the bones of the skull lie the meninges, and the meninges are three layers, the dura mater, or tough mother, arachnoid, because it's like a spider web, and pia mater, which is the thin interior most lining. These meninges are basically sacs that surround the brain and the spinal cord. And so when we talk about the focal injuries, we often talk about them in relationship to the meninges in terms of where blood accumulates. So the space between the skull, the bone, and the dura is epidural. The space between the dura and the arachnoid is subdural. And the space between the arachnoid and the pia mater is the subarachnoid area. So between the dura and the skull, you have arteries, the middle meningeal artery in particular, but there are others as well. And so if you have a head injury that causes one of those arteries to tear and start bleeding, you'll get blood that collects between the dura and the skull. And it basically peels the dura off the skull. And you can see on that CAT scan a very clear lens-shaped collection of blood it's contained by the skull on the patient's right and the dura as it pushes towards the patient's left. These injuries are actually fairly easy to treat because these are extra dural. It's just a matter of getting to that blood with a drill, which is something a neurosurgeon does, not something you do shipboard. These types of injuries are characterized often, or at least classically in their descriptions, by something called the lucid interval. So there's the initial trauma, and it's sufficient to knock the person out. So they have a loss of consciousness. They then wake up. They may have a headache. They may seem a little confused. But they're lucid, and they're at their baseline. So in that time period, they seem to be fairly normal. And then as that blood accumulates, it squashes the brain, pushes it sideways, you get what's called mass effect, starts to push it down, you worry about herniation, and that expanding hematoma results in a coma. And so that period is called the lucid interval, and that's a fairly classic description of an epidural hematoma, although I've seen many patients with epidural hematomas who are hit in the head and are unconscious from that point on because of the briskness of the arterial bleeding. Now, if you get bleeding under the dura or subdural, you're actually tearing veins. There's bridging veins between the dura and the arachnoid. And when the brain's shaken around, those can tear. And when they do, they bleed. But it's venous bleeding, so it's not high pressure. It's lower pressure. They tend to bleed more slowly. And the bleeding expands slowly. So if you look at this CAT scan, 
what you see is not that nice contained lens shape collection of blood, the hematoma between the skull and the dura, but rather blood on the inside of the dura that's sort of spreading out and slowly compressing the brain. So it's a little less focal, although it's clearly in one area. And these patients tend to have their changes in mental status over time. So this is your patient who hits their head and they don't get knocked out. They have a headache. They go back to work and at the end of the next watch they go to bed and then nobody can wake them up when it's time for them to return to watch because by that point the subdural has progressed to the size to compress the brain. And so if you have a patient who's had a significant head injury and you're worried about the possibility of a subdural hematoma, you're not quite ready to evacuate them, you need to come up with a plan for how you're going to regularly reassess them to make sure that they don't have this decreasing mental status, which would be characteristic of the subdural hematoma. Now, the blood vessels within the brain tissue, the brain parenchyma itself, can also tear and bleed. And it's kind of like the contusion, the bruise, only worse. It's a really big contusion or a lot of bleeding. And these can go on bleeding, and that hematoma, as it expands, squashes the brain, and you end up with that mass effect, the compression of the brain. So these patients will often have a headache, they'll have altered mental status, they'll seem confused, not necessarily unresponsive, but a Glasgow Coma score of 12 to 14 maybe, um, if it's not lower than that. And eventually they go into a coma as this continues to expand. They may have focal neurologic findings based on where the area of the bleeding is. These are concerning because there's not a good way to drain or address these as opposed to an epidural or even a subdural hematoma which can be drained. So the recovery from these really depends on how much damage there was done initially, how much swelling there is, whether you end up with a hypoperfusion state because of increased intracranial pressure, and overall how the patient does. So the big things for you to do, and these really are, t you're not going to know they have them, you're not getting a CAT scan, but the patient with a head injury and the altered mental status is to provide plenty of oxygen and make sure that they don't become hypotensive from any other trauma. So what's your treatment for these patients? Pretty much same as you just start with every trauma patient and really every medical patient as well. Body substance isolation and scene safety. Control any exsanguinating hemorrhage because they may have multi-trauma and you don't want them bleeding out and having low blood pressure. Airway, breathing, make sure that they don't get hypoxic. Support their circulation. Do neurologic exams. Expose them to look for other injuries and find other clues on the scene. And you need to do cervical spine stabilization because you can expect these patients to have cervical spine injury. Your keys in managing the patient with a head injury is to prevent the secondary brain injury, to prevent hypoxia by providing high flow oxygen and uh, by non-rebreather greater than 10 liters per minute, usually 15 liters per minute. Ventilate them with a bag valve mask if need be. Give them IV fluids to prevent hypotension. Keep their systolic blood pressure at at least 90 millimeters mercury if they're a multi-trauma. Aim for 110 to 120 millimeters mercury if they are isolated head injuries. And make your evacuation decision quickly. Anyone who has a closed head injury and has altered mental status, <clears throat> so not necessarily just a little confusion, but Glasgow Coma Score 14, 13, talk to medical control get them off the ship. They need at least to be monitored somewhere where if they get worse, there can be a neurosurgical intervention if needed. So we've talked a lot about the Glasgow Coma Score. What is it? Well, it's a score designed for testing patients' neurologic function, specifically related to head injuries. And it's been generalized to almost all types of patients, but it's really around head injuries. And it scores them based on eye-opening, verbal response, and motor response. And so the lowest score is a 3. You can't score lower than a 3. If you ever tell anyone you have a patient with a Glasgow Coma score of 0, they will not listen to a word that you say. The lowest score is 3, and that's no eye-opening, no verbal response, and no motor response. The highest score is 15. And on a 15, their eyes open spontaneously as you approach them, their verbal response is appropriate, 
and they obey commands. Lift your hand, they lift their hand. Then you score anywhere in between there. And really, any GCS below 14 is very concerning. And a GCS of 14 should get your attention to think about, is there potential for significant injury that I would need to evacuate this patient? A GCS of 15 is a reassuring sign, but the Glasgow Coma Score is like a vital sign. It's not really the individual Glasgow Coma Score that matters unless it's grossly abnormal. It's the trend over time that's important. So your detailed history and physical includes the sample history, symptoms, allergies, medications, past medical history, last meal, and events leading up to the patient's chief complaint. You use OPQRST, onset, provoking and palliating factors, quality of the symptom, radiation to another region, severity, and timing to really get good details about what happened and how they're currently feeling. You want to particularly focus on whether or not they lost consciousness at any time and are they on any blood thinners, including aspirin, all of which increase the risk of intracranial bleeding. Then you do a head-to-toe exam, including a pupil exam. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And a neurologic exam, including motor and sensory function in the hands and feet, and posturing and pain response, which we'll also talk about. You do an initial and a serial Glasgow Coma score. And any patient with altered mental status gets their finger stick blood glucose checked because their cause of altered mental status may not be traumatic at all. It may be medical and you need to sort that out. So you want to do a pupillary exam, and what you're looking at is size. Are they constricted? Are they mid-position? Or are they dilated? Equality, are they the same size on both sides? And reactivity to light. When you shine a light in, the eye should constrict, and you want to know if they do or not. And we describe a normal exam as pupils equal, comma, round, comma, reactive to light, or P-E-R-R-L. And you can mark P-E-R-R-L if the pupils are equal, comma, round, comma, and reactive to light. Looking at this patient, you see that the pupils are unequal. And in an awake, alert person, we call this anisocora, and it can be a perfectly normal finding in the patient. This can be medication-induced. If this patient had a head injury, and was awake, alert, and talking to me, I would not be worried about herniation syndrome because a patient who's herniating who gets these pupillary findings is unresponsive. So if I have this patient, he's suffered a head injury, and he's lying unresponsive on the ground, and I get this pupil finding, I am incredibly concerned that he is undergoing herniation syndrome and will die shortly. Now we talk a little bit about posturing, and posturing is your motor response to a painful stimulus. So this is something you're going to see in a relatively unresponsive patient. Their eyes aren't going to open. Their verbal response will be garbled or really none at all. And you apply a painful stimulus, and they get this involuntary posturing, and it comes in two forms, decorticate and decerebrate. In decorticate, the arms, particularly the elbows, are flexed, so they move towards the core. And that's how I remember decorticate. You're flexing in towards the core. The wrists are flexed, the elbows are flexed, and the hands are clenched. The fingers are in flexion. The legs actually extend, and the feet inwardly rotate. So what you see in this diagram is what would happen if you applied a painful stimulus to a patient who had a severe brain injury, and they had this involuntary decorticate posturing. Decorder kit is considered less bad than the cerebrate, although frankly, anyone who has a head injury who's got any type of posturing like this, it's bad. In the cerebrate posturing, the arms are extended. So if you look at the elbows on this patient, they're in full extension. There's some flexion over the wrist. The, the fists are still clenched, but the elbow extension is really the, the hallmark or the key finding when you apply the painful stimulus, you get this bilateral, although it can be unilateral, um, but typically bilateral extension over the elbows, um, some rotation of the wrists with outward flexion, and the legs are extended and also inwardly rotated here. And 
these different responses have to do with a variety of what are called nuclei in the brain and spinal cord responses to stimulus and, and what tone extensor versus flexor is predominant based on the types of injuries. But decerebrate is considered worse than decorticate. Again, if you've got someone with a head injury that has either of these abnormal posturing responses, it's bad regardless. So you've got this patient in front of you, they've got a GCS of six, they've had a head injury, you controlled external bleeding, maintaining airway breathing circulation, you do your neurologic exam, you expose them, you find your clues, you stabilize their C-spine, you're preventing hypoxia, and this patient you are going to need to do positive pressure ventilation. No one with a, that depressed a Glasgow coma score is maintaining their own airway. You'll probably have to suction them because they're going to pa be passively regurgitating or actively vomiting. Talk to medical control about getting an IV in. You need to prevent the hypotension, keep their systolic blood pressure greater than 90. And if they're not multi-trauma, go for 110 to 120 millimeters mercury. If they're having evidence of herniation syndrome, you can consider hyperventilation at 20 to 30 breaths per minute with positive pressure ventilation. Unless you're getting them out of there soon, you can expect if you see that, a short-term improvement and then worsening in death and evacuate these patients. So how can you screw this up? Well, you can forget that patients with head injuries and altered mental status often also have cervical spine injuries and take someone with an epidural hematoma that can be drained and they return to their baseline and make them a quadriplegic because you forget to stabilize their C-spine because they also happen to break their C-spine during the event but hadn't yet gotten a spinal cord injury. But now that they've altered mental status and you're moving them around, you create a spinal cord injury. So don't do that. Just if they have a head injury and they've altered mental status, assume they have a cervical spine injury and stabilize and maintain the cervical spine. Uh, you can fail to prevent aspiration. So you fail to suction the patient, um, fail to fully immobilize them and rotate them up on their side if they're vomiting. You can fail to prevent hypoxia, so you don't give them supplemental oxygen or you don't do positive pressure ventilation, so make sure that you do that. And you can fail to prevent shock. So get the IV in, be prepared to deal with shock, particularly in multi-trauma. A head injury alone, until they're at the death point, typically doesn't cause hypotension. It causes hypertension. So if you're seeing shock, you got to be thinking what else is going on with this patient. So what else can you do to anticipate problems? And these are really things to keep you from being caught by surprise. Well, you can expect that these patients will have seizures often at the time of injury and then also potentially at a later time in hours to days if, in fact, they cause brain injury because now they have an area that can get irritated and precipitate a seizure. So make sure that you're at least thinking about that and you know what your anti-seizure medications are, what you have available, what your doses are. Get your IV in. You're going to do that anyway in case the patient goes into shock, but you want to have access for managing seizures. You can anticipate that they will crash on you. And so while there may not be anything you can necessarily do, knowing that they're likely to do that, their, their Glasgow Coma score can drop very quickly have your airway equipment out and ready. Have your suction ready. Know that you may need that stuff because these patients become very sick very quickly. And you should assess for other causes of altered mental status. Just because your patient whacked their head on a beam doesn't mean they weren't shooting up and their altered mental status isn't caused by narcotics, particularly opiates. And just because they hit their head on a beam and they've fallen down doesn't mean that they didn't do it because their blood sugar was low. They may be a diabetic who's taken insulin or taken their oral agents and now have a low blood sugar. So check for hypoglycemia and look for evidence of uh, intoxicants. Okay, now we're going to talk about spinal injuries. And to talk about spinal injuries, we need to talk about the spine. So let's start at the right side of this slide with a picture of the spine. And what you see are essentially five sections of the spine. You've got the cervical spine with its seven cervical vertebrae. You've got the thoracic spine below that with its 12 thoracic vertebrae. 
You've got the lumbar spine below that, that's your lower back, with the five lumbar vertebrae, and sometimes there are four, there, there can be some variants, uh, but we typically say there are five lumbar vertebrae. Then you've got the sacrum, which is the back part of your pelvis, and that's five vertebrae that have fused essentially into one bony structure. And then hanging off the bottom, you've got your coccyx, which is your residual tail, which would really help you keep balance if it was still a tail, but it's not. And that's ver right down your tailbone at the bottom of your spine, and that's what you hurt and can break when you fall right onto your butt. So how do you remember these? I won't take credit for this mnemonic, but if it works for you, cast teen thugs like small children. Cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, coccyx. Looking at the picture in the middle, you can see roughly where various levels of the spine are located, and that kind of gives you an idea as you're examining a back what you're dealing with anatomically based on the topographic anatomy. So top of your top of your scapular ridge there is about T3. Right down low at the top of the pelvis, you're looking at the L3, L4 area, and that just gives you a rough idea. Now, going to the left, we see a close-up of the spine. And the spine is two things. It's a bony column that lets us do amazing things like rotate our head around, bend and flex, turn at the waist, um, which is pretty phenomenal. That's a very intricate structure because it also provides all our support for our upper body over the pelvis. So it's weight-bearing. And that's the bony piece. And then there's also a canal through it through which your spinal cord runs and between each of those vertebrae you have nerves that are coming out. So looking at the left there that blue structure in the middle that's your spinal cord and that runs in a canal made up of the vertebral bodies which are anterior and then you can see there are bony rings they're a little hard to see on this picture. You can see them actually more on the whole picture of the spine on the right. You can see how there are bony extensions that go back to the spinous processes in the back where they fuse, and those form the outside of the spinal canal. And then coming off the spinal cord are the nerves, which come out between each of the vertebrae and those spaces that again are, are really much more visible on the picture of the spinal cord or the spinal column on the right. And then between each of your vertebrae, you've got these nucleus pulposa or discs uh, that are cushions between the vertebrae, but they can be pushed out and can press on the spine or can press on the spinal nerves where they come out of the spine. So that's your basic structure and you can break the bones anywhere. You can break any of those structures and you won't necessarily hurt the nerves by breaking them, but if you have an unstable fracture, you can see how if, take a look at that whole picture of the spine on the right, look at the L2, L3 level. You can see how if you had a fracture, you disrupted the ligaments that hold the spinal bones together, the vertebrae together, if they were disrupted, L2 could slide forward on L3 and any part of the spinal cord that was L3 or below would essentially be sheared off or compressed by the bone moving forward. So here's your spinal cord and it starts at the base of the brain and extends down almost to the base of the spine, although for the last part of it below about the L2, L3, L3, L4 level, it's actually just lacy nerves hanging there. It's it's thinned out so much that it's no longer a big th thick structure of the cord. So looking at the picture on the right, you can see how the motor and sensory nerves extend from each spinal level out to innervate the skin, the muscles, the organs. And they come in at fairly discrete levels, and those are called dermatomes. And so it's important if you've got a patient who has a sensory deficit of some sort, motor, uh, 
or a sensation deficit, and you think they have a spinal cord injury, to go initially to the feet, go to the hands, figure out if there's loss of sensation and motor function there, but then work your way up the body, into the core, up the abdomen, up the chest, and see how high the sensory loss or the motor disruption, the motor paralysis goes, because from that you can actually predict the level of the spinal cord injury. So how do we cause injury to the spine, both the bony spine and ultimately the spinal cord? Well, we can hyperextend the neck, so push it backwards more than it should go, hyperflex it or push it forward. We can compress it or crush it. We can over-rotate it and pop the, the vertebrae apart where they lock up with each other. We can do lateral shear injuries that pulls the, the vertebrae side to side versus each other. Or we can do what's called distraction where you yank and pull on the body and the head, pull in opposite directions and pull the vertebrae apart. And you can see in this x-ray at the lower part of the cervical spine, the vertebrae are lining up normally, they follow a nice curve and then suddenly there's a huge disruption where that vertebrae is distracted from the one that's just above where the x-ray turns white from the shoulders and soft tissues. And that's very concerning on an x-ray. So just like with traumatic brain injury, you can get primary and secondary spinal cord injury. Your primary cord injury happens at the time of injury. It happens immediately. It's typically irreversible. So somebody falls off their stairs. They're lying on the ground. They have no motor function from the waist down. It is unlikely they will ever get it back. They have suffered a spinal cord injury that the cord is cut or torn or damaged in some way that happened immediately that it's it's un, it's a physical damage that's unlikely to be reversed. Secondary cord injury, though, is just like secondary brain injury. You can get it from the swelling, from the bleeding, or from hypoxia and hypotension. So we do the same things to protect the spine that we do to the protect the, the brain. We try to prevent hypotension, and we try to prevent hypoxia. So in our assessment, we start again with our initial or primary survey, X, A, B, C, D, E, F. And concerning findings would be a patient who's awake but can't breathe during your breathing assessment. If they have a spinal cord injury at C3, 4, and 5, those are the levels that control the diaphragm. And if there's damage there, then the diaphragm can't flatten and the patient can't breathe, even though they may be awake. Under D, you may find an unresponsive patient, and there it can be because of a head injury as well, because just like many head injuries are associated with cervical spine injuries, cervical spine injuries are also associated with head injuries, and so they may be unresponsive from a head injury. They may also be in shock due to a mechanism called neurogenic shock that we'll talk a little bit more about. And under F, you're looking for a mechanism of injury that's consistent with a spinal injury. So did they do something where they could have actually injured their spinal cord? When you check their vital signs, they may be completely normal. Or you may find vital signs that are consistent with neurogenic shock. It's a little bizarre. They're hypotensive, but they have a normal or a slow pulse, and they have warm, dry skin. We'll talk about why that is shortly. But if you find that, you should be very concerned about a spinal injury. You also do a focused history. Are they complaining of any pain along their spine? And do they have any weakness or inability to move one or more extremities? On your exam, do they have tenderness along the spine? Do they actually have what's called step-off, where this, you can actually feel the spine changing its position relative to the other parts of the spine? Or is there any other deformity? Is there a lot of local muscle spasm, which will accompany a fracture or other injury? Do they have loss of sensation? Do they have loss of motor function? Do they have loss of rectal tone and sensation right around the rectum? Because it turns out that the very lowest spinal nerves actually are the ones that give sensation to the area right around the rectum and give you rectal tone. It's not your toes. Uh, it's just the way that the spinal cord works. Um, but that would be very concerning for a distal injury. And if it's an unresponsive patient, do they withdraw from pain painful stimuli? Or do they posture, which makes you worry about a head injury?
Now, your spinal cord plays a really important role in controlling your blood pressure. So the spinal nerves control what are called the adrenal glands, those little glands sitting right up on top of your kidney, and they release what are called catecholamines, so adrenaline and noradrenaline. And their job is to increase your blood pressure, which by increasing your heart rate and by causing your blood vessels to squeeze down peripherally. And you always have some peripheral vasoconstriction that's being driven by these catecholamines. That's called your sympathetic tone. And so if you have a spinal cord injury and the adrenals aren't communicating with the spinal cord anymore, then you get this unopposed vagal stimulation, so what's called parasympathetic tone. That slows down the heart rate. And you take away that sympathetic tone, that background vasoconstriction where all your blood vessels out in your arms and legs and your periphery are just slightly squeezed down, they dilate. And so now you're hypotensive because your heart rate's slow and your blood vessels are dilated. So you're in shock, but your heart rate can't go up because of this vagal tone and your skin is warm and dry because your body can't squeeze down the blood vessels the way it normally would in shock. So it's an odd picture, but when you see it, the patient with hypotension, bradycardia or a normal heart rate, and warm, dry skin, and any evidence of a spinal cord injury, be very concerned. So what do you do for these people? Same as you always do. X, A, B, C, D, E, F, after you've made sure the scene is safe and you've got your body substance isolation on. Then you make a decision regarding whether or not you need to immobilize their spine. And we'll talk about this. But with an alert, conscious patient, you may be able to determine that they don't have a significant spinal injury and you may not need to do spinal immobilization. I mean, contact medical control about an IV, pain medications, and based on your findings, making a decision about evacuating the patient. So... It's not inconsequential to immobilize somebody. If you place a patient into spinal immobilization, they have to be evacuated. There is no way that you will keep someone who's spinally immobilized shipboard. Having made that decision, you believe there's a reasonable risk that they have a spinal injury, that they have to be evacuated. There are a number of immobilization-related diseases, blood clots in the legs, breakdown of the skin, chronic pain, and so immobilizing people is not benign. These devices can do significant harm, particularly the long spine board, which is a solid structure, when it's, it's rigid, it's, if people don't properly pad it, it can really cause a lot of skin breakdown. And actually, there's no evidence that immobilizing people improves their outcome in terms of spinal injuries. And so it's a, it's a big deal to immobilize someone, not the actual process, but making the decision that you're going to do it. Unfortunately, if the patient has a spinal injury, and if through unnecessary movement and failing to immobilize, you move the spinal canal such that it injures the cord, that's also really bad. So you need to immobilize those who need it, and don't immobilize those who don't need to be immobilized. So how do you decide who needs to be immobilized? And our big concern is the cervical spine. The thoracic spine is very rarely injured. When it is, it very rarely displaces because all the vertebrae are stabilized not only by the vertebrae around each other, but also by the ribs. It's a, a solid structure. The lumbar spine can be injured, but it's fairly low, and oftentimes a lumbar fracture doesn't result in a spinal cord injury because the spinal cord is so small at that point. So the cervical spine is the one we, we get really concerned about, although we do need to make sure there's no injury anywhere along the spine. So how do we decide who needs to be spinally immobilized? There's actually no one study that will tell us who doesn't need to be immobilized. What we do have is really good research about who doesn't need an x-ray. Why don't they need an x-ray? because we don't believe that they have a significant injury. So this study called the Nexus study, which looked at emergency x-rays in patients with suspected spinal injury, is a set of criteria that you can use to determine whether or not you will need to immobilize the patient. 
The patient must meet all the criteria, and the remainder of the spine has to have no evidence of significant trauma. If you find tenderness, significant tenderness over the lower thoracic or the lumbar spine, anywhere else, you immobilize the whole spine. But if you don't, then you can use these criteria to determine whether or not you need to do any spinal immobilization. So, patient doesn't have altered loss level of consciousness. They're completely alert and oriented. They're not intoxicated. They have no focal neurologic deficits. That means you need to check motor and sensory function in all extremities. There's no midline spinal tenderness and no significant spinal pain that's more midline than anywhere else. They have no distracting injuries. And this is kind of you know, a little ambiguous about what we mean by distracting injuries. But the general concept is they don't have any injury that would be so painful that they might not notice that they also broke their neck. So if they broke their thumb and they have a spine injury, they'd probably know that they have a spine injury. Their, their neck would hurt enough that they would pay attention. If they amputated their forearm and they have a spine injury, they may not notice that their neck's hurting as well because they have the amputation. So if all of these are no, then you don't need to do C-spine immobilization. If you are going to do spinal immobilization, first and foremost, primum non no cherry, first do no harm. Try to, to do this as benignly as possible. Maintain the C-spine in a neutral position. If you're putting them on a long spine board, pad all the voids. And the voids on most patients are behind the neck, cervical spine, behind the lumbar spine, behind the knees, and behind the ankles. Because you will cause significant pain and even joint damage by not padding and supporting those areas. Plus, that decreases some of the pressure on the pressure points, the back of the head, your occiput, over the shoulder blades, over the buttocks over the heels where you tend to see a lot of skin breakdown in a very short time. Long spine boards are for moving patients. So if you're moving the patient to your, the aid room and then it's going to be hours before they're evacuated, you can leave the cervical collar on. You can remove them carefully from the long spine board as long as you have them on a bed and you feel that you're capable of making sure that they are not moved in any way that's going to cause a cervical spine injury and that they're going to be able to cooperate and also not move. And if you have a vacuum mattress immobilization device, use that because those take care of most of the pressure issues. And while you're still immobilizing someone for an extended period, you actually can decrease the chances of a lot of the bad things that can happen from immobilization, particularly the skin breakdown and the pain. If you need to open an airway, use a jaw thrust so that you can keep the cervical spine and the neck in a neutral position. Use airway adjuncts like your oropharyngeal or nasopharyngeal airways to help you keep that airway open. And if you think the patient has a spinal cord injury, give them 100% oxygen unless you're absolutely convinced there's nothing else, nothing going on uh, because you don't want them to have a hypoxic injury to the spine on top of the mechanical injury that they've already suffered. If you think they've got neurogenic shock, immobilize the spine. It may be a partial spinal injury. You don't want to make it any worse. Give them IV fluids. You've got to fill up all that empty space in the dilated vessels because that's the only way you're going to turn this around. So you're maintaining, maintaining a minimum systolic blood pressure of 90 millimeters mercury. And again, unless they're multi-trauma, you're targeting 110 to 120. So this is also good for their brain if they also have a brain injury. And evacuate them as soon as you can. Not that I need to tell you that. You're going to see these patients know they're sick and want them to not be on your ship. There's a lot of controversy about do we leave helmets on? Do we take helmets off? So if someone's got a protective helmet in place, generally the feeling now is that it's best to remove it if you can do so safely. And there are some specific reasons why you absolutely have to remove it. If the airway's compromised, you need to get the helmet off. If the helmet compromises your ability to immobilize the patient, you got to get the helmet off. If the face shield can't be removed, so you can't get into the airway, the helmet's got to be removed. 
And if the head's flopping around inside the helmet and the helmet's not immobilizing the head at all, the helmet's got to be removed. The only reason you would stop trying to remove a helmet is if they had worsening neck pain or they got numbness or tingling or even brief paralysis while you're trying to remove it. Uh, at that point, just pad and stabilize as best you can because you know they've got a very unstable injury if that's the case. The removal technique will vary by the helmet. The real key is, as much as you can, put your gloved hands onto the head. And that may mean coming up underneath the bottom of the helmet. But you're trying to maintain the cervical spine in a neutral position. So manual stabilization. You may have to come through the front of a helmet and then have someone else partially remove the helmet and then have that person come down from underneath the bottom of the helmet and hold on and then you remove the rest of the helmet. You may have to come up with some kind of a phased approach to do this, but you want to get hands on the head and keep someone's hands on the head to maintain the cervical spine in a neutral position. If there's parts of the helmet that can be taken apart and taken off, do that. That'll make it easier and then carefully remove whatever helmet remains, maintaining neutral positioning of the head. Please complete any knowledge reviews, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact your professor or instructor. Thank you very much.